Now, I'm not an expert in this either, but there are many financial economists that have now begun to study the financing that's used by movie houses, and it's really quite innovative. So let me tell you a little bit about how the movie industry works. So first of all, it turns out that these movie studios, there are still today five big movie studios, as they were 20, 30, 50 years ago. But the five big movie studios have a very different business model today than even 20 years ago. And here's the difference. It turns out that the movie industry actually is about two different kinds of businesses. And let me tell you what they are. One business is making movies. It turns out that making movies is really hard. That is, it's hard to pick a winner. In fact, the Hollywood insider Richard Goldman, screenwriter and uh, a famous author, wrote a book about the Hollywood film industry and said that, uh, you know, in this industry, nobody knows anything. And, you know, that's a very famous phrase that was quoted many times. And I didn't understand it at first, but when I started looking at the economics, I finally got it. Nobody knows how to predict a winner or loser. It doesn't matter whether you have a big name movie star, a big name director, producer, a great location, a big budget. None of those things can predict whether you're going to get a huge hit, a blockbuster. So film production is a tough business. I'll show you in a few minutes some data about that. But there's a second business. The second business is in licensing and distributing films. That is a great business. High margin, high return, low volatility business. So for example, striking a deal between uh, Sony Pictures and Netflix in order to make a few movies and then have Netflix distribute them. It turns out that the distribution business is a very, very profitable business. So about 20, maybe 30 years ago, the Hollywood film industry decided, hey, you know what? We ought to get out of one business and get into the other business. Let's stop making movies and focus instead on licensing and distributing movies. Now, wait a minute. We haven't seen a decrease in the number of new movies. So what's happened here? I'll tell you what's happened. Before I do that, I want to tell you about the risks of movie production. Okay? Does anybody know what the probability of a blockbuster movie is in Hollywood? If you're an investor in you know, the next uh, Superman movie or, or some other franchise, what's the probability that that movie will be a blockbuster, meaning that it'll generate you know, five times what the cost of the film is? It turns out it's about 5%. That number should sound familiar to you, right? It's about the, the, the probability of producing a cancer drug. Now, um, there was a paper that was written uh, a few years ago by a couple of film uh, uh, faculty, uh, academic uh, uh, studying the film industry, where they tried to estimate the probability of a success using all sorts of fancy statistical techniques. They tried to predict winners and losers, right? early form of machine learning. And what they showed was nothing works. There is no factor that can predict. And moreover, if you look at the histogram of the rates of return on films over a period of time, this is what it looks like. This is a sample of 900 films from 2000 to 2009. And this is a histogram of the rates of return. It was produced by a, a film student from NYU, in the film school, studying the, this uh, industry. And you can see that you've got some big winners, some big losers, and everything else is just sort of in between. Nobody knows anything. You can't predict. It doesn't matter. Now, now I'm going to tell you about what a really creative film industry decided to do, a, a creative uh, a company in the film industry decided to do. So you may have heard of a company called DreamWorks SKG. It was started up in 1994 by three film veterans, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, Jeff Katzenberg, and David Geffen. And they decided to partner together with Paul Allen, the, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, to create a new film studio. And they produced lots of movies from 1994 on. But one of the things that they did really creatively was in 2002, they raised $1.5 billion of money. 
And they raised it not in the form of equity, but in the form of debt. They issued bonds. And the way that they did it was to say to investors, they said, here, we want to borrow one and a half billion dollars from you. And what we're going to do is to pledge as collateral a slate of movies. The next, say, 25 movies that we, the three of us, are going to make. We don't know what they are, but we know that we're going to get scripts because of who we are. And we're going to pledge the receipts from those 25 scripts as well as the royalties from some existing movies that we've made over the course of the last few years. We're going to put that all into a pot and we're going to borrow money from you to make those films and if we don't pay you back what the promised interest is, you get to take that pot. And they raised one and a half billion dollars. It's called slate financing and it, it was a departure from how movies were financed because prior to this particular event, the way that they financed movies was, okay, we're going to make a movie about Batman. So let's go out and talk to investors about Batman and let's try to raise money for Batman. And that's it. It was just one movie. And not surprisingly, after a while, investors got tired of getting uh, uh, you know, totally destroyed in terms of their investments because the probability of success was 5%. So it turns out that this kind of slate financing caught on. In 2005, Gun Hill Road, a company that was formed as a joint venture between Sony and Universal, they raised $600 million for a slate of 17 pictures from hedge funds. Hedge funds invested in that. 2005, Legendary Pictures was launched in partnership with Warner Brothers. Hedge fund investors approached Warner Brothers and said, you know what, we're going to give you $500 million for 25 of your pictures. And one of those pictures happened to be the whole uh, uh, hop, uh, the Tolkien uh, Hobbit uh, uh, movies, made tremendous amounts of money. Between 2005 and 2008, $12 billion was raised for Hollywood. $4 billion from hedge funds, $8 billion from private equity investors, financing not one movie at a time, but a portfolio of movies, a slate. This is called slate financing. That term comes from the fact that you know, typically when studios have a list of their projects, they write it on a blackboard, on a, on a piece of slate. They would write them down. And so slate financing has gotten so popular that now it's become routine. And, and I want to illustrate to you why this is such a big revelation through this paper. There was a paper published in 2012 studying how slate financing has really transformed Hollywood. And this author decided to look at the profitability of a bunch of movies and demonstrate that Legendary Pictures, which is one of the companies that I just cited, this is their slate of movies that they developed and this is what their investors got. Not any one of these films, but the entire portfolio. All right. So now you probably can't see this from where you are, but I'm going to read to you a couple of these movies and I just want to see whether or not you've heard of these movies and what you think of them. So there's Superman Returns, which was made in 2006. There was um, uh, the movie 300 about some uh, you know, sweaty, muscular guys, half naked, you know, fighting with swords. There was, um, uh, let's see, Where the Wild Things Are, which was an animated picture, uh, animated film uh, from the, uh, the book by Maurice Sendak, a kid's book. Um, uh, the Town, which is a movie about a Boston-based bank robbery with uh, Ben Affleck and Jeremy Renner and some really big names. Of the movies that I just named, can you tell me which one made the most money? Which one do you think was the blockbuster of what I just named? I, I've hidden the results. I'm about to reveal to you. That's over here to the right. But let me just tell you that Superman Returns, this is the franchise that you all know, I'm sure. In 2006, they spent $270 million making that film. Okay? That's, so that's a, that's a big number. I want you to compare Superman Returns with that bunch of sweaty, uh, muscular men. Uh, 300. They spent $65 million making that movie, okay? Versus The Town, which is the Ben Affleck movie, $37 million making that movie. Which do you think did the best? What would you guess? Which is the blockbuster? Superman Returns? 
No, that's the Superman franchise. They spent $270 million. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of R&D. Come on. Really? So, so, all right, let me show you the answer. It turns out that Superman Returns made $391 million. If you spend 270 and make 391, that's OK, but that's not great. 300, they spent 65 million, and they made 475 million from these sweaty guys. They should have had 600 instead of 300. <laughs> they would have done better. And now, the town, 37 million dollars, they made 145, 154 million dollars. Not great, but not bad. I mean, you know, that's like four times the amount of money. Small money, but actually good return. The film that did the best was Batman, The Dark Knight. That made a billion dollars. 185 million invested, they made a billion dollars. Nobody knows anything because all of these movies had big name directors, big name actors and actresses. One of the best performing movies is a movie that I have not yet seen, The Hangover, which uh, I'm told is a pretty fun guy flick that was made for 35 million. They made, they made uh, you know, uh, more than uh, 300. Kind of astonishing. The point is that betting on any one movie is very, very difficult. But betting on a slate is actually pretty good business. And now we actually understand this, which means that investors understand this, which means that the cost of capital for making movies has gone down. Why? Because there's not as much risk. I'm not very worried about a slate like this, whereas if you want me to finance one of these pictures, I'm going to charge you 20%, if not more. So this is an example where financing plays a critical role. But it's not just financing. We need the funding. We need investors that are willing to do it. And if you take a look at the recent announcements of studios, slate financing is only growing. Billion dollar transactions happen routinely in financing Hollywood movies, despite the fact that nobody knows anything, despite the fact that it's a 5% probability of success. The point is that if you have the right portfolio, you can finance it. Now, you also need analytics. So these are debt finance deals, which means that somebody has to look at whether or not the debt is good debt or bad debt. In other words, you need ratings on the debt. So guess what? There are rating agencies now that specialize in slate financing. You might ask, how could they do that? They don't know anything. Nobody knows anything. What is there to rate? Well, it turns out that they draw these wonderful pictures of the certainty of film uh, ultimates, development phase, pre-production, post-production, pre-release. They can actually look at how certain are you to be able to earn money. It depends on where you are in the development cycle. Does that look familiar to you? Phase one, phase two, phase three. And there are analytics that they put as various different ratings of debt depending on the kind of slate that you have. Despite the fact that nobody knows anything, we actually can know something when we put together all of these different pieces.